So I'm a clinical geneticist, and what that means is that I work in clinics and I understand something about genetics. Um, are you too tall? Oh, man, <laughs> the tall timber problem. So um, there are other sorts of geneticists. There are molecular geneticists who work in labs and understand DNA in far better detail than I do. It's like having my pet giraffe here. Right? Um, but basically, clinical just means I'm medically trained. I was a pediatrician and then did extra training in genetics. Some geneticists are adult physicians and then do extra training in genetics. And um, I guess my role is, uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. So my role is mainly to assess babies and children in the clinic. And sometimes the babies are in the womb and sometimes they're born. And my role is to sit down with the parents, take a family history, find out about the, the, the baby or the child and what problems they're having, do a clinical examination, and then make some sort of assessment of what's going on. Um, sometimes I see people if there's a concerning family history or a past obstetric history, so they may not actually have a child with a condition, but there may be a history in the family of a child with a condition. Often I see people because of abnormal um, results that need interpretation, be they screening results or diagnostic results like microarrays or exome sequencing. And then what geneticists are meant to do is they're meant to listen, they're meant to advise, and they're meant to share information with people, and that's what we call genetic counseling. So genetic counseling isn't just about how you're feeling, it's, just, it's also about a transfer of information between somebody with more knowledge to a family with specific needs. So what sort of things, what do you experience, I guess, if you see a clinical geneticist? Well, it sort of depends how you're feeling about yourself, if you have a condition or how you feel about your child, if your child has a condition. But generally, people seem to have three sorts of experiences. They can come and see me and I, I can say, look, this is actually quite a serious problem. That's usually if we're talking about a baby in the womb or a child that they brought for an assessment. And parents generally find that quite distressing and upsetting. So we obviously... I've obviously learned over the years to try and manage the distress that parents can see, can feel rather. Um, I might say, look, I'm not sure what's going on. We're a bit worried about your, you or your child, and we wish things were clearer, but we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. So the uncertainty can be quite difficult for parents. And sometimes I'm able to say, look, this is a, you've been referred with this quite significant concern, but in fact it's going to be okay everything's going to be all right. And that's obviously the consultations that I like and enjoy the most because it makes everyone leaves with a sort of a warm, fuzzy feeling. So the next question I was asked to answer is, what is your DCC passion and what led you to it? Well, I guess it was, um, I started doing uh, fetal diagnostic clinics in about 2002, and I worked at the Women's in Monash and subsequently the Mercy Hospital. And... I was never really sure what to tell people when the sonologist came to me and said the baby's corpus callosum was missing. It was a bit easier if the baby had a whole lot of other problems or results on microarray that could give us some guidance as to what was going on. But if the baby just had absence of the corpus callosum with nothing else obvious on ultrasound, it was very difficult to advise parents what was going to happen with their particular baby. So I thought I've always been looking for avenues to try and find out more about this, to try and learn more about it so that the advice I can give people in that setting can be better, really. The same difficulty, I guess, we had with newborn babies and young infants and children who had absence of the corpus callosum before a point in time where their development could guide you in how they were actually going. So you probably know that parents with new babies and young infants are quite anxious because they can't look at the child themselves and work out what's going to happen. By the time the children are five or six, usually the parents have a fairly good idea about what's going on and they seem to be calmer and more settled. So I thought I probably needed more information for that age group as well. And the other, the other reason I, I got some passion from about <coughs> disorders of the corpus callosum was because I spent some time with Linda, who you've probably all heard speak and some of you will have had the pleasure of meeting. And Linda's one of those ridiculous people where her enthusiasm just seeps into you. You know, you just become uh, excited about stuff because you've heard, heard her speak about it. So I'm really grateful that I met Linda and was able to spend some time with her and be part of this consortium because she's really an inspirational person to all of us. So, what's my piece of advice for you guys? I don't. This was the hardest question for me. Um, I think that. 
probably people are probably best off at working out what their own advice should be. It's very difficult for me to say what my advice to you should be because I don't happen to have a child with this condition. Um, I think if I think clearly, it's probably that having a child or having a disorder yourself or having a child with a disorder, it's a journey, it's not a race. You can't just sort it out in you know three months after the diagnosis. You're really in for the long haul in terms of trying to understanding, trying to understand what's going on with you or your child and how you're going to manage that. And I think the important thing is to remember it's not that different from the rest of the people out there. All parents are not quite sure about their children, and all of us as individuals are not quite sure about ourselves. It just seems to be a more exaggerated form of that if somebody's brought a concern to your attention. My other bit of advice is that when a child has a rare condition, don't expect everybody else to know about your child's condition to a great degree. Um, clinicians tend to work with general principles. Geneticists are expected to know a bit more about rare conditions because that's our business. But you really need to become an expert in your child and your child's condition and your child's symptoms. And you need to back yourself as an expert in your child's condition. If you're an, a, a person with a condition or an adult with a condition, it's pretty much the same. You've got to have a better understanding of your rare condition than the clinicians you see because you can't expect the average clinician to be above, abreast of all of these rare conditions. So it's really about upskilling yourself and having some information to give on to clinicians who you need to see um, for your care and your needs. If I were to think about a piece of advice for um, health and educational professionals, I think it would be that they should stick to first principles. So there are times when I see people where I actually have no idea what the condition is they're coming to see me about. Usually that's because I haven't prepared properly or I'm running a bit short of time and it's a bit awkward. But I just have to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to stick to my first principles. I know a lot about rare conditions. I know how to look stuff up. I know how to assess individuals. And other clinicians you see should be doing the same thing. So if you see a physiotherapist, they shouldn't go, oh my gosh, this is a rare condition, I can't deal with it. They should go, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, this is how I go about my work and just do their general work. The same with the pediatricians and GPs. You see they all should stick to their first principles. And I suppose the, the critical thing with rare conditions is that clinicians consult with one another so that if a clinician doesn't know what's going on, that they consult somebody who does know what's going on. So if you see a clinician who obviously doesn't know about your condition or your child's condition, um, if they show signs of wanting to consult, that's a, I would stick with that clinician because they're showing that they can, they can upgrade their information about things. They can find out more even though they weren't properly prepared when they first saw you. Right, so who would I like to have dinner with and why? So some of you will be able to hear that I have a South African accent and I was born in Pretoria, which is a bit like the Canberra of South Africa, kind of administrative center. And when I grew up there, um, Pretoria was segregated into a whites area and an area for non-white people. Okay, so that was the apartheid regime. And it was a, one of, as you probably know, with the possible exception of, of you know, Adolf Hitler and the kind of Nazi era um, regime was probably one of the most oppressive political regimes in history. And uh, I went, so I grew up in a, an all-white suburb, went to an all-white school, and subsequently um, went to university in Cape Town where things were a bit less kind of segregated because Cape Town was a more liberal city. And I subsequently worked at my internship at a hospital called Woodstock Hospital, which is near the, near the Table Mountain in Cape Town. And it was one kilometer down the road from the, the big academic hospital called Krutuskir, but it was in a sort of a gangland area that was pretty violent. And what I noticed is that um, it had been the hospital where Nelson Mandela would be taken from Robben Island where he was imprisoned for political reasons to be treated for his tuberculosis during the course of his stay there. And all the nurses who were um, old enough to have seen him and looked after him were absolutely amazed by him. It, and it didn't matter what their background was. They were all completely amazed by him. And you probably know he was in prison for 26 years, um, working in a lime quarry on a small island off the coast of Cape Town. And during that time, he started a university at the prison, did a number of degrees. He was already a trained lawyer. 
um, helped a number of his colleagues to be educated while they were in prison. And when he came out, he became the president of the country, and he was not bitter about what had happened. He was an extraordinary man in that he was able to have that largesse not to be bitter about what had happened to him. And I've always tried to remember that. I think that whatever adversity life throws at you, it's important to remember these very amazing people because they teach us um, not to be resentful and not to be bitter about a set of circumstances that was just part of the time. And he was able to really reunite South Africa as president um, and, and show all of us that discriminating against people for particular characteristics was not appropriate. So I think uh, he's certainly the most famous man I've ever listened to speak. I've, I've read some of his books. I've you know, listened to some of his speeches. And he's utterly inspirational. And I think it's good to have somebody like that who you've come across in your life that you can think about as showing you the, the right way forward in general. Yep. That's me. Thanks very much. I've called this Who Am I? And I kind of thought as I put that, I thought, oh, I'm not sure I really know the answer to this. But I will tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born in Cape Town. This is a picture of Cape Town here. That's Table Mountain, the famous mountain that when the uh, southeaster wind blows, the cloud comes over it and looks like a tablecloth coming over a table. Uh, I first did my medical school training and my radiology training at Critscale Hospital in Cape Town. Um, that was adult radiology. Uh, the reason that Critscale Hospital is actually quite well known, um, pe perhaps not so much these days, is because of this man, uh, Professor Chris Barnard, who was the first surgeon who actually did a heart transplant on a, a person who subsequently lived. He didn't live very long, but it was a pioneering surgery. So it was done at this hospital, Critscale Hospital, which is on the slopes of um, Table Mountain, and that's the University of Cape Town um, that I did my training at that university. What year was that? that you the, heart the heart operation it was it well, 60s, something like that. 69, yeah. 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 Um, then I went on to do my paediatric radiology um, at Red Cross Children's Hospital, which is the hospital in Cape Town. Um, predominantly, it's for all children, but predominantly utilised by um, the ex extremely underprivileged population uh, and very different types of conditions that we saw there compared to, to what we see here. And so that's where I learnt about imaging children and how different it is to imaging adults. Um, I didn't really start on my neuroradiology until I, I came here to the Royal Children's Hospital and um, developed this interest in the brain and the brain and spine. I think up until then I was just trying to accumulate as much knowledge as I could appropriate to, to the job. Um, and since I've been here, I've done for quite a few years now um, more and more paediatric neuroradiology. So that involves the brain and the spine and um, sort of covers everything from brain tumours to developmental problems in children. So what is my DCC passion and what led me to it? I think part of it is that uh, I, I really like puzzles. And uh, to me, uh, an MRI is almost like a puzzle. I look at it from, you know, from a completely blank perspective. I try not to have pre-existing ideas, so I don't read other people's reports or what anybody else thought. And I try to put the pieces together bit by bit by bit in a very possibly obsessive fashion to try and, and see if I can form like a gestalt, if I can come out with um, you know, a feeling of what is going on for this person in a holistic sort of way, as best I can see from images, because obviously I don't get to examine the children. Um, that's for, for people like Rick and George. But um, I realised that the corpus callosum is often very central to a lot of the abnormalities that um, I was looking at. And so it's sort of trying to work out how does it tie in with the, the picture that I'm seeing of this particular patient. So um, in terms of what my work entails, I've really got kind of three arms, uh, the biggest one being clinical. So I work at the Royal Children's Hospital. I'm there three days a week. I don't only do brain stuff. I wish that I did, but we all have to do everything. So I also do see the broken arms and legs and um, all, all the other sorts of things as well. So it's any kind of imaging from x-ray, ultrasound, barium meals, um, CT scans, 
MRI scans. And um, a lot of that involves teaching, which is what I put at, as my third one. But we, we have to teach trainees because children are completely different to adults. And all the trainees who come through, they've come through adult hospitals, they have an adult mindset. They, they, they have to be taught how to think of children in a completely different way. Um, and so I spend quite a bit of time trying to impart that uh, across to them. The research that I do is a combination of um, research with the clinical teams that you see here, um, and I'm very involved in epilepsy, so I, I do a lot of research with people like um, Ingrid Schaeffer looking at the imaging. So my side is, is very much the picture side, the imaging side, the pattern recognition mm -hmm. side of um, different conditions, and trying to tease apart whether I can find patterns that can help other people in the future be able to think of a condition because they can, the differences can be quite subtle and sometimes people just haven't seen the pattern. So um, this is pretty much my day. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's me at breakfast. Then that's our dictaphone when we, we dictate reports. Um, that's probably lunchtime catching up on emails. That's me a lot of the day. Um, uh, yep, that's me having my cup of tea or whatever. This is me towards the end of the day, going home, yeah, at dinner, I, I don't think that's so much me eating as me yawning, probably. Um, and then um, this is me sort of, definitely me at bedtime, George will attest <laughs> to that. And then, you know, it got me thinking, the way all these kids sit on screens, we've probably got like a huge generation of radiologists coming up in the future, but they're all sitting and doing that all the time. Mm. So... Um, my piece of advice is, is really about getting second opinions. I don't know how well that's projecting up there, but, um, you know, like you, within your right, if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel you've got the information, if you don't feel it's been explained to you properly, to actually ask someone else. You don't have to feel bad for your doctor or, or feel like, oh, he's going to say, oh, you're a big shot, you want a second opinion. You know, you, you are entitled to find someone and to ask someone else. They might say exactly the same thing that you've been told, but that's okay. You know, that, that's all right. And I think that, you know, especially with rare conditions, as George said, you might need further information. It might be someone else who can help you. Except <coughs> Dr. Google, okay, please. <laughs> Avoid Dr. Google because his advice is not always very good. So my advice to health education professionals is kind of similar in a way. Um, I'm sticking to my particular area, which is imaging, um, especially imaging of children, is that having an MRI at the private practice down the road who, you know, really doesn't know a lot about brain malformations, it's not their fault, it's just not their area. They're looking for adults with strokes and, and brain tumours and things like that. You're not going to get the best scan. So if possible, and it's not possible for everybody depending on where you live, but if you can get a, your scan done, or at least interpreted at a specialised centre, it's really very helpful. And um, who would I most like to have dinner with? Well, um, I think this might be surprising to some people. <laughs> I um, am a great ballet fanatic, so uh, for me it would be Margot Fontaine, who um, has passed away. And um, she was wonderful for a number of reasons, not only because she was just the most magnificent prima ballerina herself. She didn't have the best pointed feet, she didn't have the highest legs, but she had something about her that just made her really, really special at a time that the Royal Ballet actually had said they wanted everybody to be equal. They didn't want to pull some people up through the ranks as being better than others. And at a time where, as a female ballerina, she, anybody else would have retired when she was around nearly 40, she developed this wonderful partnership with a young dancer who just defected from Russia, who was Rudolf Nureyev, and he was 19 years younger than her. And because they had this magic together, um, it enabled her to actually carry on dancing until she was nearly 60, which is, is quite phenomenal. And, and you know, I, I just find that absolutely wonderful to be able to bring such beauty into people's lives. Um, to me, is 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 a wonderful thing. So. Thank you for your attention. It's an absolute pleasure to actually be here and meet all of you. This is the last OSDOC conference I have to leave after the first half day for family reasons. So it's a real pleasure to be here and be able to spend a little bit more time and see what a wonderful group of people you all are and what the organisation is. 
We were speaking yesterday with Elliot Scher, who says that in the United States, um, they get about 400 families to their annual meeting, 400, 500 fa uh, people, I should say, not families, four or 500 people. So for a country of our size to have 200 people get together for a conference is really amazing. I don't think that says that we have a greater incidence of callosal malformations. <laughs> I think that says something to the enthusiasm of the, of the community. Okay, um, who am I? So I'm a paediatric neurologist. I work at the Children's Hospital just down the road here in Melbourne. I grew up in Melbourne. I trained in Melbourne at Monash University. I spent some of my training overseas, both in St. Louis and Chicago, so in the Midwest of the United States. Um, I, as a paediatric neurologist, see children with all sorts of neurological problems, from problems with muscles and nerves and spinal cord and brain and epilepsy and headaches and just everything that comes through the clinic. And I'll talk in the next question about what my interest is in brain malformations, but my day-to-day my -day work is I see all sorts of neurological problems uh, in patients from down to 24 weeks gestation, premature babies, all the way up to about 18 years, um, the whole range of, of children. I occasionally see adults that George asks me to see, um, but not very often. And sometimes with George we also see um, couples who are pregnant to give them advice, but generally I just see children. Um, so in a, in, an av in a typical week I'll, I'll do clinics and I'll answer phone calls from patients. Uh, that's my clinical work. I do ward service, which means being in charge of the whole service for a week at a time, and that's what I'll be starting tomorrow, which we all dread a little bit as neurologists because it's a very, very busy week. Um, the other part of my time is doing research, and my research is in brain development and particularly neurogenetics, so genetic causes of abnormal brain development in children. And George and I run a neurogenetics clinic, uh, which we, it's gone through the different names. About two thirds of the patients we see in that clinic have brain malformations, and I see uh, quite a number of familiar faces here of people we've met over the years. Um, that clinic initially started once every two months and then it went to once a month, and then it went to once every two weeks, and now it's once a week. And we're booked out a few months ahead, so we may even have to increase our clinics. And I also do teaching. We I teach medical students, paediatric trainees, neurology trainees, paediatricians about paediatric neurology and malformations. So that's what I do in work. Um, now, what's my passion? Um, in medical school, I remember very precisely a lecture we were given in second year by a psychiatrist who was what's called a biological psychiatrist, maybe now they're called a neuropsychiatrist, but a psychiatrist who was interested in how the brain works and functions as an organ. And I'd always been interested in the brain and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do, I want to be a biological psychiatrist. I don't want to be a psychiatrist who just counsels or does psychoanalysis, I want to be a psychiatrist who understands the brain as an organ, like a neurologist understands the brain as an organ. So I actually took a year off after fourth year medicine and did a year of psychiatry research in schizophrenia, and I hated psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> it was not what I wanted to do at all. It wasn't so much the patients, and I've got to be careful what I say here with Mark sitting there on the panel. Um, there a lot of, let's just put it this way, there are a lot of strange people. and. That, <laughs> And they weren't the patients who I expected to have problems. <laughs> so I thought this is not the environment I want to live in because I questioned my own sanity during that year. <laughs> and my, my, the next rotation immediately after that, going back to medical school, was obstetrics and gynaecology. Delivered a few babies, got to know a lot of babies, and I really enjoyed working with children and young families. And my very next rotation after that was paediatrics. And then marrying all that together, I thought, wow, paediatric neurology can really tick all the boxes. Working with children, um, working with brains, developing brains, etc., and that led me into paediatric neurology. Which is quite a long story, but I'll get to, D to DCC eventually. Um, so about halfway through my training in paediatric neurology, and I was already interested in brain development, the director of our department at the time called Lloyd Scheel. I don't know if any of you remember Lloyd. Anybody here? Okay, so some of you, Lloyd retired about six years ago now. He was the director of our department for many years and would have looked after some children with callosal malformations. 
Lloyd knew of my interest in brain development and he'd just been at a conference overseas where he'd been to a symposium about uh, brain malformations and he actually bought the videotapes for that symposium and gave them to me when he came back and said, hey, have a look at these, this might be something that interests you. And that led to my interest in, in brain malformations and brain development and eventually I found myself working with Bill Dobbins in Chicago uh, for two years. Some of you might have heard of Bill Dobbins but he's probably the leading clinician in brain malformations in the world. He wrote a paper on agenesis of the corpus callosum a few years ago about uh, the causes of agenesis and the, the title of the paper was um, agenesis of the corpus callosum absence makes the search grow longer and that's <laughs> in terms of absence of our understanding of it. Um, anyway so then came back worked in the area as, as I talked about in the first question. Um, what's my advice and I think you'll see a common theme here in what we're all saying. Uh, my advice is don't believe what you hear each child with a, with a DCC is different to the next child. It's not, a, it's not one condition, it's many different conditions that we lump together. And what you'll read on the internet, what you'll hear from other parents and other patients, you've really got to, and, and doctors, you've really got to take that with a grain of, <coughs> more than a grain of salt, because your child will tell you what they are. And it's very hard for us to predict uh, precisely. That's something we hope to be able to do better in the IRC5, give better and more accurate advice. The other thing I would tell families just in terms of how the brain works is the two sides of the brain are very good at working independently. And some of you have seen me in clinic will hear me say that. The two sides of the brain can do a lot of what we need to do without talking to each other. Okay? The corpus callosum, although important and very important in a Especially when the brain develops without a corpus callosum, there's lots of ways that our brains are very clever at working around things, which is why you know, we can be surprised, and perhaps we shouldn't be, at how well many of the patients turn out. Um, because our brains have very good ways of working around things, and the two sides of the brain can actually work quite well independently of each other. Um, advice to health and educational professionals, um, a few things. One would be, if you don't know the answer to a question, don't guess. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. And I think that's a problem we have as people who are, are sort of put on a pedestal and be, being expected to know the answer to everything. It's very hard for us to say, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, either because I'm not an expert in that area or because, I, as George said, I haven't done my research for today's clinic visit. But we see a lot of patients in our clinic that have been given bad advice. And I think we can um, underestimate the impact bad advice will have, especially when it's given very early in a child's life. Mm. It can have all sorts of ripple effect and ramifications to the child, to the family, to the school. So and we often have to untangle that. So I think clinicians should not be afraid to say, I'm not an expert in that, or I don't know the answer to that question, or I'll get back to you when I can learn a bit more, or I'll refer you to someone who does know the answer to that question. Um, and also in that is sort of going back to the last question is, be careful what you read. Even clinicians need to be careful with what they read about rare conditions. Okay, this was a bit of a hard one. Who would I like to have dinner with and why? I've been watching The Prince of Egypt quite a bit lately with my kids. Uh, I'm Jewish and we just had Passover and my kids are fairly young and they're just learning about the story of Passover. So I think um, I wouldn't mind having dinner with Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't consider myself that religious but uh, I'm fairly traditional and I'd have a lot... I think that'd be a really interesting dinner conversation about... <laughs> What was, it, what was it like growing up, you know, in, in the Egyptian palace? You know, what was it, what was, did you really see that burning bush? And what, what really happened up there on the mountain? And, you know, how did you feel when the water split in front of you? Did that really happen? I think we have a lot, have a lot to talk about. And I see Warren smiling there <laughs> as well. So um, that's it from me. Uh, happy to speak more later. So I'm, a, I'm an adult psychiatrist and, and I guess I'm a neuropsychiatrist. So what is neuropsychiatry? It's, it's an area of psychiatry where we deal with 
psychiatric aspects or psychological aspects of brain disease or brain disorders. Um, so I've been doing that at Royal Melbourne. We have a specialist unit at Royal Melbourne. I've been there almost 20 years as a, as a psychiatrist. Um, and I do have a, a, a number of special interests, particularly at the moment, uh, neurometabolic disorders. I look after a group of patients with a, a rare condition called uh, Neiman Pick type C disease. I look after an adult group of patients, but it is predominantly a childhood disorder. I deal with atypical dementias. We have a very large Huntington's disease service. It's actually the world's oldest Huntington's disease service. But we also see um, developmental disorders like colossal disorders, brain injury. And I'm across uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, a private practice, uh, but also consulting roles at other private hospitals as well, as well as an academic role at the University of Melbourne and the Florey. So in terms of what, what led me to this, and it actually goes back to my senior registrar year almost 20 years ago at Royal Melbourne Hospital, a young man who had a major mental illness, it was unusual, <coughs> he had some neurological symptoms, people had tried to work out what was happening with this fellow. And one of the things that I remember was that he actually had an unusual uh, colosum. I, I'd become uh, quite involved in looking at MRI scans. We'd had our MRI scan at the Royal Melbourne for a couple of years. And we embarked on a hunt for what was happening with this fellow because he uh, had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, but there was clearly something else going on. And I developed, and ultimately this, this became a PhD where I looked at uh, the, the shape of the corpus callosum in a range of psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, to try and look at shape signatures. We did actually um, find some quite interesting things, looking at, uh, uh, if you see the top left, that kind of the, the front part of the corpus callosum, changes that happen there in illness in people who may develop schizophrenia, who have developed schizophrenia, can actually tell you a lot about what's happening with their disease and can actually predict uh, various elements of what's happening with with their illness and we found similar things in, a, in other mental disorders as well. And because, I mean, perhaps a bit like Simone, I'm actually quite geeky, I like playing with my computer, I like doing all sorts of things, MRIs are really interesting, we developed all these wonderful methodological ways using s some of the fantastic stuff who were with our research group and now at the Murdoch, Mark Seal, Chris Adamson, uh, Amanda Wood, on um, looking at kind of shape and what you can actually do with that as a biomarker for different illnesses. And, you know, they're just some kind of groovy pictures that we've kind of put together with, with some of our research collaborators. And that's kind of where I get kind of my geek side out. So if, if maybe that's another strange aspect of me, I kind of um, love playing with computers. And people will have seen these images um, where we use a type of MRI to look at kind of brain tracks. This was something that I've been involved in. I actually kind of was thinking about this talk and trying to kind of present something interesting and visual. And I pulled these images out and actually realised that the date stamp on these, these are 10 years old now, these images. So we were doing some of this DTI work almost 10 years ago. So th there's a huge amount of changes in technology since then that hopefully kind of allow us to kind of link not just what's happening in the brain kind of anatomically with the sorts of experiences and changes that we see in people with a range of developmental conditions. So just kind of quickly in terms of what I do when it comes to um, disorders of the callosum, I guess in particular, is obviously like most uh, medical doctors, there's always a thorough assessment of what's going on, what's brought people here, because I predominantly see adults. There'll often be a history of kind of involvement through child services and the system, and then what can often be a very difficult transition into adult services. Uh, but really there's also, I guess, the, the validation of the lived experience of living with any kind of brain disorder, really, no matter how you are affected. And as people have said, that sometimes people don't always understand whether they're other uh, health practitioners, whether they're people involved in care or family members, uh, colleagues, friends, etc. But because I am a psychiatrist, I also, I will treat specific psychiatric symptoms in all sorts of conditions. And that's not just about medication, that's about psychological therapy, and sometimes that's about coordinating care and plans for care. And I think in particular, um, for people that I see, it's being aware of some of those difficult issues. We <coughs> spoke in one of the adult sessions yesterday with um, Professor Lynn Paul about um, you know, some of the difficulties that people have in transition to adulthood in navigating what is the time of onset of most major psychological disorders, late adolescence, early adulthood, and, and how having a developmental disorder can actually kind of modify that and what that experience is like and what, what the outcome of that might be. And I think also 
having something that's uncommon can mean that the healthcare system doesn't necessarily have a straightforward place for you. There are often services, and we see this particularly in mental health and, and in public mental health, which is a, it's a very problematic system that we have, that if you don't kind of fit a couple of significant diagnoses, then there's just very little for you. Or if there is, you're turned over quite quickly to make space for someone else. And so navigating services, if you have a rare condition, can be really, really problematic. But also that transition from paediatric to adult services, particularly if you're a young, young adult, can be very challenging and with all sorts of changes to the funding models that we have as well right now. Particularly with the NDIS, it just, uh, it seems to be so confusing for so many of the people I see, particularly if they have crossover with the mental health system as well, who's going to do what and when you have confusion, everyone seems to hang back and not do anything, which is enormously frustrating. So I guess um, in advising families, I think when it's particularly with something that is not common and, and where it can be difficult to find a place in the healthcare system, um, it's having a champion, whether that is your doctor, your general practitioner, or <coughs> someone even outside the, the health field, uh, who can also uh, be uh, involved in captaining the ship as well. Sometimes for people with kind of uh, issues that span different domains. There can be fragmentation of care and no one seems to be kind of leading things. Um, and so I think our, our healthcare system is actually one of the world's best, but there's still fragmentation and it can still be difficult to find a home. Um, when it comes to me advising uh, health professionals, I guess, I mean, people have spoken about the need to communicate, but I guess also to collaborate and, and work together in developing models of care for people, but also, in research and obviously with great organisations like OSDOC um, and just to mention it's obviously a privilege to come here today. I also think advocating is important. Um, I, I think of, of someone that I, I've seen recently who had seen one of my colleagues some years ago and very much the answer of that assessment was well there's, we know, we know what you have but I'm not really sure there's anything we can do for you and I guess I, I feel there's, there's usually something that can be done. Um, particularly when it comes to advocating for people to kind of find a place in the healthcare system so that needs can be met, which is a challenge. Uh, all right, and just lastly, so when it comes to having, having dinner, there is actually an obvious answer to this. I have, we have a, a nine week old at home, so I'd really like to have dinner with my wife at some point. <laughs> um, we, we got about this close last night. I think there was five minutes, but um, and with you know three kids at home, it's it's actually quite challenging. Yeah. I, well, tw 20, 20 years. I hope it gets better. Um, so look, I've actually put two people up there, and look, it's a bit bland. I, I, Isaac Newton, I put up there because recently my eldest was learning about the Black Plague in history, and Isaac Newton got he got kind of had to go back to his kind of childhood home from Cambridge for a couple of years, two years during the Black Plague, and in this time, apparently he saw the apple fall from the tree. It's not really sure if that's the case, but he also developed his no, uh, the, you know, the, the notion of optics, that white light is made up of all different colours in a spectrum, and had a lot of great ideas when he was away during the plague, and it's perhaps one of the, the history's first great sabbaticals, that he was kind of away <laughs> in the country, having a think, and, you know, and as I'm coming up to my second sabbatical, that's something I'm thinking about. <laughs> But on the right is um, a Lois Alzheimer. And Alzheimer is interesting to me because he was actually probably one of the first neuropsychiatrists. Um, perhaps a little bit like Rick, he kind of thought about neurology, psychiatry, and he was probably going to be a, a medical anatomist early in his career. But one of the interesting things that happened was he was invited, as was customary in, in Germany at the time, if you were a wealthy family, you had a mentally ill uh, patient, then you would often get a nice young doctor to accompany that patient and travel with them as they kind of roamed around Europe. Um, and that's what he did and he met a, an interesting uh, young woman and he, it kind of formed his kind of notions about doing psychiatry. But he, his first patient was actually a 50 year old woman who was uh, quite unwell psych psychiatrically who ultimately ended up having a young onset form of Alzheimer's disease and he discovers uh, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. But he actually did a, a range of interesting things in contributions to medicine and neurology in terms of syphilis and Wilson's disease and studies of epilepsy and hippocampal changes in epilepsy. And towards the end of his career, he was actually uh, trying to look at uh, going back to looking at um, 
biological changes in the brains of people with major mental illness, particularly schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, was involved with a number of the German psychiatrists around that time, um, and ultimately kind of failed. And, and I, I think to give him credit as perhaps our first neuropsychiatrist, you know, that's, that is still a challenge in kind of major mental illness, linking kind of biology to the, 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 um, the symptoms that people have, the functional difficulties that they have in their life. Trying to build the bridge across those sorts of domains is, is a real challenge, but he was perhaps the first in, in my field to really do that. Um, and that's me and my interest. Thanks very much. This is your opportunity to grill, quiz, and ask questions of the panel members. Uh, can you just uh, raise your hand, stand up, introduce yourself, because it is all about connection with others. So uh, who's going to be our first to cap off the rank? Please stand up, introduce yourself and fire away. Uh, Peter, um, just a question for Mark. Is there any paediatric use? <laughs> um, like a paediatric version of you? Uh, no, that's a, that's a good question. In Melbourne? Um, it, it was, um, <laughs> yes, I'm just actually, I'm just drawing a blank on her name, which is inevitably what happens when you're in front of 200 people. But, um, <laughs> psychiatrist who ran something called the Paediatric Organic Psychiatry or POP Clinic at the Alfred. Um, and she came and spent a couple of months with us at Royal Melbourne. It will come to me and I will, yeah, and track me down and I, I will, um, I'm not sure she's uh, practicing publicly but I think she still is privately. Yes. Can you Peter? Who's next? Yes, up there. Um, Mark, what's the pathway to referral um, to see you for a young woman with a disorder of coughs? Uh, general practice referral is enough. Okay, thank you. And your name is? Oh, sorry, my name's Andrea and I'm step mum to Emily, who has a uh, age of coughs. Thank you. Can you stand in the room? Ah, oh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Don't, yes. On me? Yeah. Yes, your name? <laughs> Rose, hi. Um, my daughter's got quite a complex brain um, and I just often wonder if how much of her behaviour is to do with the actual physical sort of part of her brain. Is that sort of something worth looking at, you know, investigating as to sort of are some of her behaviours intrinsic to her brain disorders type thing or, you know, do I just run with it? Just... Who's going to take that question? <laughs> Yeah, this might be a joint answer between Mark and myself. It's very difficult to disentangle the different components of a, of a, a complex structural brain uh, developmental abnormality and, and the behavioural aspects that come out sort of the other end in a way because there's all sort of different components. There's the effect obviously of, of the malformation and there's the effect of, I don't know if, whether she's got epilepsy or there's the effect of the treatments, <clears throat> there's the effect of education and missing school, there's the, the psychological effects. It's, it's very, very difficult to disentangle all those different things and, and Mark can do that. <laughs> I, 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 I would second that. Look, it, it is incredibly difficult, and in the end, what you probably end up building is is a reasonable probabilistic model about what may con be contributing to what. But the, the, the point will be, what of those can you actually impact upon? What of those might be potentially addressable, manageable, and not just through biological means. Sometimes that might be about changing, say, the school environment or all sorts of different things. So it's it, it's. It's, it's difficult, but look, I, I would argue, because that's kind of what I do in an adult setting anyway, and by and large what I've been doing professionally for most of my professional life, so I intrinsically think it's worth doing, um, but I, I guess you've got to have an end point in means because uh, you will want to know, well, what can I actually do, what of these is changeable, what is not. That's not defining that person that, you know, and you're just kind of like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But, um, but yeah, Hi, South Australia. Hi, South Australia. Hi. South Australia. Hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah so you... Yeah, so you... Finding, finding someone who actually is kind of willing to sit yeah, down yeah. and spend time and time. Because it's really hard yeah. sometimes to know what behaviours, you know, what you can do about certain behaviours. And we've sort of got a complex range of behaviours, so you know. 
Yeah. Hi, I'm Fiona. Um, my daughter is nine years old. Um, is it has it been thought of having a corpus callosum clinic? You know, in the way that the Royal Children's, for example, has epilepsy clinics and things, because it is very difficult to to know about you guys. We go through the Royal Children's since her birth, and yeah, we've not heard of. Dr. Rick, for example, <laughs> and we go to the neurology clinic, you know. Where do you go to? Which neurology clinic? Uh, the Royal Children's okay. Clinic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, our clinic, we ultimately call our clinic the Neurogenetics Clinic or the Brain Development Clinic, depending on how we feel for the week. <laughs> this is the clinic that we run, we see children that don't all have, have genetic conditions, but we see a lot of children with different types of brain malformations. What will happen, if you come to that clinic, you'll see George and I. Um, Simone <coughs> would have usually looked at the scans beforehand, as, as we all would have. It's, it's more of a, it's a one-stop assessment clinic rather than an ongoing management clinic, where we give advice about the cause, the consequences, um, talk a bit about research, go through the scans, and then help uh, direct you to the right people for, for ongoing care, whether that be someone like Monica who's in the audience who works with children with complex disabilities and her team. Um, so that's what that clinic is. So that's often a very useful clinic as a first step in, in getting accurate advice about the problem um, and being directed to the right people for care. Hi, I'm Tracy. Um, this is specifically to Mark, but it sort of covers everyone. Um, with regards to um, psychiatric disorders and MRIs, obviously cost is prohibitive as far as checking everyone for disorders of the corpus callosum, but there's obviously a link towards autism, possibly other psychiatric illnesses. I look at my family, um, it's very obvious with my two-year-old son that he's got brain abnormalities and we know where he's heading or have an idea, but I look at, say, my mother's side of the family who have, I have a number of cousins that possibly sit on the autism spectrum and I wonder whether there is possible research down the track plan for looking at disorders of the corpus callosum, psychiatric illnesses. Um, what's sort of in the pipeline, what's the future looking like for <coughs> research and links towards those disorders? I probably can't speak too much to the research, but I do know that uh, Professor Richards in, in Queensland with the US team is kind of doing quite a lot. And I know that some adult people have been involved in some of the research that is happening there. Um, I, look, I think there's, there's a big opportunity here in Australia for this to happen, particularly as people have, uh, people have rightly pointed out the very great turnout here today. We have a motivated group of people and I think that's implicit in what you're saying, that, that people are interested in, in becoming involved in research and looking more. Um, I, I think at the moment what I can say is hopefully watch this space. So I imagine some things will come out of this meeting this weekend as well with the clinicians and researchers involved, I think that hopefully we'll be able to answer your question more fully in the months to come. There is now like a, a fair amount of research that people are doing in regards to um, you know, slight changes in the corpus callosum. So there was a recent paper about um, you know, the, the size and the, and, and again, I guess Mark was looking at shapes and things. So the corpus callosum is being researched and in regard to autism and all sorts of things like that, but not necessarily a disorder of like that we we have here in terms of agenesis or partial agenesis. So I don't know if there's enough. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name's Stella. I just um, have a quick question about the variety of disorders. Um, so there's partial agenesis, there's agenesis, there's hyperplasia. Are there any particular characteristics that each of those terms have? Because my son I was diagnosed with hyperplasia, but then when we came to see you at one stage, Rick, you clarified for me, no, it's partial agenesis. 
Well, I don't know that this is reassuring, but for our last um, two, before, before this meeting, we have our own scientific meeting that um, we have all the overseas people come who are involved in the consortium. And the past two meetings, so this year and last year, there's been extensive discussion as to the terminology that gets used and um, whether we should put out um, a paper that says, okay, well, you know, whether we are one of the research groups, we're not the only people in the world looking at this, and this is what we suggest the terminology is for each <coughs> condition. Um, and even amongst the group, you'll find people have different terminology that they use yeah. and that they kind of identify uh, as, as describing certain things. Like I have in my own mind what I think hypoplasia means, but someone else might have a different idea. Although I think that we're all pretty like-minded, so you know that that's one thing we have been discussing, trying to put out a unifying terminology. Because really, the only one term that gets agreed on is agenesis. If it's not there, everybody's okay with agenesis. But other than that, there's such a range of, of um, terminology that gets used. Um, the other thing that's clear is you can't you can't predict the symptoms and signs from the different classes of MRI changes. So if you have agenesis or thin corpus callosum hyperplasia or partial agenesis, which I think of mostly as a shortened corpus callosum, that doesn't seem to be, allow you to go, we expect these symptoms in this particular child. Mm -hmm. So it really is a case-by-case -case assessment. Mm -hmm. we, we have agreed at, at the meeting here in Melbourne to put our heads together and, and publish consensus sort of statement on how we describe, at least at the imaging level, the various malformations we're seeing with the hope that that'll bring some sort of unity in, in what radiologists are reporting and what clinicians are talking okay. about. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, up back. Your name? Lisa, hi. My daughter has ACC. And I'd like to know if you've heard of a lot of instances in which ACC leads to uh, midline facial abnormalities. So I guess um, we had a, a fellow train with us recently called Patrick Yap. He's a geneticist back in New Zealand now. And um, he has an interest in um, a group of conditions called craniofrontonasal dysplasia. And I think that's an example of a situation where you have um, both midline brain anomalies and changes in facial appearance with particular reference to the midline. Yeah, so the my daughter also had a, has actually a midline lipoma in yeah. her brain. And um, it, they actually advised that it was sitting where the corpus callosum should have formed. Yes. So, so I guess the, we, we, we see the lipoma quite commonly, but not necessarily with facial changes. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg debate. We're not quite sure if the lipoma stops the corpus callosum from forming or the fact that the lipoma is there is a symptom of the corpus callosum not forming properly. Um, when you get to changes in um, midline facial appearance, then you really need a geneticist to try and put those two things together. So I, I'm pretty sure you would have seen a geneticist yeah, previously. They couldn't, they couldn't, um, yeah. Yeah. There was potential for charge syndrome, but then they couldn't even. Yeah. And it is still quite hard to do that, to be honest. I mean, we we have a meeting once a week at the children's where all the geneticists from. Melbourne, which is about 11 of us, sit together in a room and look at photographs of children particularly, sometimes adults, and we're trying to recognize what the genetic cause for their problem is by looking at their facial characteristics. And um, it, it's, it's a sort of a, about a 30% yield, I think, if we're lucky, so probably about 30% of the time we have some idea about what's going on based on facial appearance, but the rest of the time we're a bit at sea. Um, if so you, there's no direct link with ACC and the midline facial I think there probably is. Okay. It's very unusual to have two rare things happen in a child that aren't linked. It's not impossible, mm -hmm. but um, I guess if you wanted to show me photographs of your child um, in one of the, when we were you know, chatting and, and meeting each other, that would be absolutely fine. My name's Briar. Um, look, I'm quite new on this journey and I'm wondering, the next steps is obviously getting my daughter involved in research and things. But I'm also wondering, she's 10, how, how do I go about informing her and getting her consent to be part of this? I, you know, I, and it's, it's something I'm sort of struggling with. I, I don't want to 
made that decision for her. Um, but I feel that she needs to have some buy-in to any any research that's that's so, done on her. Yeah. So I think that's a very mature and um, a really super parental approach to consider <coughs> daughter's well-being in that way. Um, I guess that we have in our clinic's genetic counsellors who, um, Kate Pope is our genetic counsellor, some of you will have met her at the conference here, and uh, she often has discussions with parents about how to pass on information to their children and what's an appropriate age with a view to the children being part of decision making about their health. Um, we think that it, it really is on a child by child basis as to how children can be involved in that. And it sort of relates to um, their cognitive abilities and their understanding about what's happening to them. So if we took what we would call a neurotypical child, so the average child in the community with regular development, um, probably from about 12 years of age, they could be pretty much involved in decision making about that sort of thing. Um, the law recognizes that by 14, children should probably have a decision, uh, a involvement in decision making, and yet uh, children are minors until 18. So I guess the parents have to make an ultimate decision about what the most sensible thing to do is. So I think that um, what I've encouraged parents to do is to, when children are younger and they ask questions about themselves, especially if they're identifying differences between themselves and some of their peers, it's an opportunity to start a discussion about what you know about their condition. And um, if the seed is planted very gently, um, and you can, you know, I, I met um, Karen, 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 yes, Karen here the other day, um, and I'm going to send her daughter, Annalise, um, a little PowerPoint of her MRI scans um, so that she can show them to her class at the age of nine. Um, so she's got to that point where she's quite interested and she wants to explain to some of her peers what's going on. Now obviously Karen's going to need to help her with that um, because it could be, and Karen, sorry, I'm, and Annalise's dad is there as well, I'm sorry mate, I've forgotten your name. Um, so they're going to have to go through that before with her, so when show and tell time comes at, at class, she can anticipate the reactions the other children will have. But it's starting that sort of journey with your child so that they're aware that they have something that is different from the average child, but are not necessarily intimidated by it or feel shameful of it, because once you get into the teenage years, shame is a big problem for all children, irrespective of what's going on with them. So I think it would just be about starting that conversation with your child, and then when you feel comfortable getting to the point where you recognize options for them like research and just asking them how they feel. And I suppose the thing is not to try and rush that process. I think, you know, if it took a year for you to have a discussion with your child about a research option, that would be quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the research can always wait mm -hmm. another 12 months for your involvement. Obviously, we're hungry for people yeah, to be involved. It seems like it's so important. But, yeah, it, it is important, <laughs> but it's important not to rush your, yourselves and your child to be involved. Mm -hmm. So the first step is just to find out what's available, how you get enrolled, and what the consequences are. For a child, that usually means a blood test. That's the main thing they would worry about.